everything you need to know. The show will start in just a moment. Friends out there in YouTube land, Rob here today. I want to talk to you about a really great camera. One of my favorites right here. It's the Instax Mini Evo. As always, these videos come to you live and unsponsored. What I'd like to share with you today is if you like anything that we're talking about here, if these tips are helpful, please get yours down from the links in the doobly doo. Okay, now that that's being said, we're talking about the Instax Mini Evo, and we're going to have a comparison to that to a couple of different cameras. Now, as we talk about these cameras, there's a couple of things I want you to know. This is everything you need to know before jumping into the Instax Mini Evo. I want you to think about that as we fade this music out real quick. Friends, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. The reason this is important is because I get a lot of questions about what what is actually the Mini Evo? What are we doing? And how does the Mini Evo compare? And to other cameras in the line and what should I do? I mean, I answer this question a lot. I, I really feel like I've said everything that there is to say about the Instax Mini Evo. So I look at this video right here as a roundup of all the great things that the camera can do for you. And the camera is a really cool camera. Now, just before we jump off into that, I do want you to know, I have actually written an entire piece about the uh, Instax film back in 2017, 10 things you need to know about Instax mini film. You can go find it on my roberthamphotography.com website over on my great wedding photography or great photography blog. Uh, this actually comes up in Google if you type or ask Google, um, hey, what are 10 things I should know about wedding photography or instant film? Excuse me, what are 10 things I should know about instant film? And Google will answer you with, with uh, this question, <laughs> with this. Just try that out. That's all I'm saying. It's kind of fun. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, you know there's a reference there. This is going to be a little bit of a longer video, but you guys come around because you like the fact that we talk a lot about the video. We talk a lot about the topic. Now, I've actually structured this to be kind of open-ended, and this is a live stream. So if I see anything pop up, I'll answer them at the end of the video. I don't expect to see too many questions on this video because this one was not announced. It was just, hey, I've gotten so many questions I thought I wanted to share with you. Okay, all of that stuff aside, what do you need to know? First of all, let's look at the cameras. There are a couple of different types of cameras when we talk about analog, we talk about digital, we talk about mini Evo, we talk about Fujifilm, we talk about Instax. There's things you got to know. First of all, Instax is a print that looks like this, okay? It's a credit card size print. The overall dimensions are roughly two by three, a little bit smaller of a printable area that you see right there. It develops with a reverse Sigma process, that's kind of cool. Read about it on the blog. And it gives you beautiful, vibrant, vivid colors, high contrast curve, low dynamic range. So the highlights and shadows are very, uh, very in a specific range. It's easy to crunch your shadows and blow out your highlights, but provides a, an image that develops about 90% of the way through within the first minute, two minutes, and uh, the rest of the way that other contrast comes in over the rest of the night. Okay, lots of fun to take these pictures. And they come in cameras that look like these that you see back here. Now, these are actually set up in two separate stages of cameras. We've got our analog cameras right here, and we've got our digital camera and printer and digital printer right here. The number one question people ask me to compare the Evo to the Mini, that's the, um, the Mini 90, this is the number one comparison because the Mini 90 is the flagship Instax Mini camera that Fujifilm makes. This camera right here has all of the features you would find on an analog camera film camera, except for uh, any manual functionality. And I've done 30 videos on this camera. So if you're interested in this camera, check out my day in the life videos or check out my mini 90 playlist. You'll see all of that stuff. And the camera has a lot of functions like self timer. You have the ability to do exposure compensation. Um, you have uh, several different modes for portrait landscape, things like that, which make using this camera easy. It's got a very bright Xenon flash. And those things together mean that this camera, of course, double, double, um, dual photo capability, which means you can do dual shot, same image on the same print right here. Um, you can go ahead and use this just like any camera. Point, click, picture, ejects. That's the way it works. That is not how the Mini Evo works. You get to choose which images you print on the Mini Evo, and that's because the Mini Evo is a digital camera. It is a digital camera behind this faux lens. This is not the actual lens. The lens is the really tiny thing inside there, but it looks like it's got a big lens like these other ones. And it stores images on a memory card. That allows you to do a couple of things. There's a digital suite built in here with very limited editing, but some crop, rotation, rotate, 
brightness, color adjust, and fun filters. The filters on this camera are really cool. They're all digital filters. And they're really nice. We'll talk about those later. But because this is a digital camera, you can print any image that you ever take in any order that you want to take or not at all, which is nice. There is a difference, however. This is an actual lens and analog process, right? The lens focuses the light onto the film, which is basically in this area back here, right? And that film is directly exposed through the lens. That is not how the Mini Evo works. The Mini Evo works by simply adding a printer to a digital camera, okay? So it's like having a printer built into the digital camera. So when we look at these two things, now you know. When you're looking at the Mini line, like the Mini 7, 8, 9, 10, or 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, all of those Instax wide, 300, um, Instax square, SQ10, stuff like that. When you look at those, you're dealing with um, cameras that take a real image focused through light and hitting the film plane, hitting the actual film. Now, when I get asked questions, we're doing this in two separate ways. When I get asked questions about film and analog film instant photography in the mini size, people always want to know Mini Evo or Mini 90 versus the Mint Instax uh, RF70, excuse me, TL70. Okay, I have this here because this is my favorite Instax mini camera of all time period. Until I get something that's more um, manual with a complete manual controls, and there are some things out there now that weren't out there then, but this camera right here is an amazing camera. Pop-up Xenon flash in the background. I can't get it to pop up because I'm on camera and this is live, right? Pop-up Xenon flash right there. Um, viewfinder, right? Uh, which is nice, bright viewfinder, twin lens design, Multiple uh, aperture priority right here. So you set your aperture, wide apertures, things like that. Lots of fun with this camera. This is a more difficult camera to use. The learning curve is larger because you have more settings. And Instax Mini Film has a very uh, low dynamic range. So it's easier to blow out your images. The meter on here works well. The difference between these two cameras is you can go down to f5.6 on this Instax Mini Film, which means you can completely blow out the background and get that beautiful bokeh and blur. Okay, we've talked about that. These are the two cameras that most people ask about if they know anything about photography when they are talk talking about the Instax Mini Evo. For people that don't know a lot about instant photography that are just getting into it, they talk about the printer cameras, right? Now, this is important here too. And this little deep dive is, is really helping us set up the stage for why the Evo is different. Because it's a digital camera with a printer built into it, many people recognize that you can do a lot with that. That means that you can use technology to trigger this camera wirelessly through an app on your phone. You can print images off your phone using this camera. There's a lot of really great features and things that can, can go along with this digital technology that's built into here. And the number one question between this is, hey, how good is the lens and the image quality compared to just a regular share printer? And like, if I wanted to print from my Fujifilm camera, would it be better to get a share printer and just use my Fujifilm camera or would it be better to get the Instax Mini Evo? And the answer is um, muddier than you might think. The reality is your printer, and this is an older printer, they have newer ones out, but the printers that they have out now will print at a higher resolution from your phone or from your camera, like your Fujifilm X-T2 or 3 or 4 or whatever, than will the Mini Evo from your phone or your camera. The reason they did that, I believe, was simply to not cannibalize their printer. Because if this could print at the exact same resolution as the printer from your phone or your camera, as well as directly off the Mini Evo, then there would be no reason to buy the Instax Share printers, the current models that they have. What's the printer resolution difference? The horizontal is the same, the vertical is different. 600 when printed directly on either one of them, 300 when printed from your phone. Now this is an older one, it only does 300 by 1200 or 600 by 1200. Anyway, so don't worry about that, but there is a difference in print resolution. Here's the question. Will you notice it? No, you won't, you will not necessarily notice it. Uh, when looking at them side by side on the small format, it's barely a difference. 
Okay, that being the case, I'm going to move all of these other cameras out of the way so that we can talk about something else, which is very important. And I think that is the everything you need to know. In 30 seconds, we're going to get the, the countdown timer set. Well, that's the wrong one. Let's get it set right here. Like I said, it's live, baby. Let's go up here to 30. Sorry, my friends. Done. Okay, here we're going to go. Everything you need to know that you won't like about this camera in 30 seconds or less. And we're beginning. First of all, it's chunky. It's hard to actually get the shot to take its place right on time because it's slow. You won't be able to see the screen outdoors. Its autofocus is muddy at best. It has face detect autofocus, but it constantly hunts, and I don't particularly care for it quite that much. Most of the filters aren't really any fun. You're going to find the ones that you like and use them. And overall, it's kind of got a weak flash. It's not a Xenon flash. It's just a regular LED flash. Oh, wow. We did it. Okay. So I hope that was worth the wait. Those are everything you need to know that you won't like about this camera in 30 seconds. The flash is weak. So I always use an external constant light flash on this camera. And the reason is quite simple. I've done photos with this camera at weddings and things like that. You're going to need additional image. You're going to need additional light with this camera. It's just that simple. That flash won't do it. The next thing that you want to know about this camera, and we'll get a close up as we're talking about it, is that uh, although it is slow, it, it is slow. If you're going to try to photograph kids at play and stuff like that, or dogs running around, the camera has some lag to it. So that's that's something you just have to just have to take into your own account. But when we talk about the camera as a whole, like the things that it does well, the idea that you can only print the images that you want, you don't have to print every single image, the idea that you can have a built-in camera monitoring suite, you know, like a, a, almost like, I dare say, Photoshop. But just imagine lights, contrast, saturation, color, rotation, adjust, crop, things like that. That's a really nice feature. I have actually grown to really like this camera quite a lot. I originally didn't like it, and, and here is one of the reasons. The, the lens... Okay, the lens is fine, actually. Um, we won't really talk about the lens, but they used a smaller sensor. Now, I've got a video on the sensor that I believe that they used, and if that's the one that they used, it's a 2013 camera lens or camera system on a chip, a lens on a chip, and it came out of an HTC One M8. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a long time ago, which means that there you get five megapixel images. The reason that's important is because they're very... Well, oh, they're very compressed images. So 5 megapixel, very compressed images. If you were going to use this camera specifically as a camera to document your life in an easy-to-go format, everything would be perfect, except for the images that it saves are really only good enough to print these pictures this size. If you tried to print, let's say, a 4x6, and I've done this, I've got a video on it, but if you tried to print a 4x6 image on a piece of paper... Uh, the image would look muddy, splotchy. It would look like a really bad front-facing cell phone picture that you tried to print at Walgreens. That's because there's just not enough information in the JPEGs. It's all compressed so much. Now, that is a problem for me because having a, this type of a camera to carry around with me, I love it. I absolutely love it. I don't even mind that it's digital. It was a big problem. It produces beautiful images. It's that simple. There's just It just produces pretty images. But to use those images anywhere else, like it's got a built-in image share app where you get to any image that you print, only images that you print, which is a way to make you buy more film. But for only images that you print, you can share them to social media or your camera roll with the Fujifilm border, you know, that pretty little border, you know, whatever color you'd like, and share them easily on social networks. Yeah, well, that works if you're going to make one Instagram post or Facebook post. But if you want to put them in your house and print on like a, like, like I said, a 4x6, it just won't look nice. Which means that as a camera to catalog your life, like if, if and I get people to ask me about this all the time as a travel camera. Rob, should I buy this as a travel camera? My answer is no, you cannot buy this as a travel camera. Let's say you're going to take that trip to Paris. It's your first time you're going with your high school uh, trip you know, they do a lot of that in, in the U.S. We'll go on trips at senior year of high school, especially if you're in like a foreign language club or something like that, or even in college. You guys know the deal. So you'll go on trips around. So you're going to Paris. You're going to Marseille. You know, you're, you're going wherever. Hamburg, right? In London. 
you're going to go to all that stuff. If you take this with you, it's going to print off the cutest little portraits that you can imagine. But when you get home and you start looking at that detailed shot, you're going to kick yourself for not using your cell phone. If you got any modern flagship, iPhone 12, 11, um, or, or Samsung Z Fold 2, 3, or whatever, or S20, S20, 21, 22, stuff like that, the, this image quality is going to be better, period. It's a better quality image. So for that reason, I don't suggest it. What do you suggest then? Well, if that was the case, if you want, for that specific reason of travel, if you want really high image quality and you want the ability to print off portraits in a credit card size, you need a share printer. And if that's the case, you need a Fujifilm camera. And if that's the case, uh, or any camera that has a smartphone app, you could use any camera with a smartphone app that will transfer to the smartphone that will then use the printer app to print. So for those reasons alone, right, Fujifilm, I, I, I spend this amount of time to share with you because I've gotten hundreds, literally hundreds of comments asking if this is a good travel camera. And if I took this as my only travel camera, I'm a working wedding photographer, but I don't carry my big gear when I go for my family. I take a Fuji X100F or something small like that. I might take an A7 II, an old a, a Sony A7 II and a 28 millimeter or a 35 millimeter lens. And I call it a day. I travel light and small. If I were to take this with me, I would never do that as my only camera. Would I take it as a supporting camera? Absolutely. I would take it because it's, it's fun. But in the idea that the images are no longer useful other than this format, for me, is a deal breaker for anything that I want to keep long life. Now, that being out of the way, if you want to use this for any other purpose, if you think to yourself, hey, I'm okay, I don't mind the 5 megapixel images, I've shown you the videos and what they look like, then yeah, this is a great little camera to carry around. It's a lot of fun. Let's now talk about why the camera is so fun. I'm going to go ahead and put it over here so that we can see. Let's get that little switch up, right? We're going to go ahead and turn it on. Turning it on it has a little on button right here, okay? We turn it around. I want you to be able to see it start up. So right there, Instax is beginning. We're going to come right on over here. And now that Instax is all started up right here, we're good to go. So as you can see, it started up. We've got the our images that are already on here, lots of different little images, and we can scroll left and right and all that stuff. I know they're looking kind of blown out, but look how nice that is. This is a great format to be able to put in a room as like a time capsule camera, right? You could put a 64 megabyte or, or gigabyte SD card in here like I have, and then you would get 51,000 photos. You'll never need to take that out, and then you'll have a small time capsule and leave everything over the next 10 years that you photographed. The battery is not replaceable. It's a lithium-ion battery. We'll talk about that for a second. So, uh, And Fujifilm does not currently have a replacement plan. This is a $200 camera. I believe they have a life expectancy of this camera for five years. So a 32 or 64 gigabyte card will last longer than the camera will. You, it's a lithium polymer battery that's inside of here, which means that you're going to get that smart technology that keeps the batteries alive. I do expect that this camera will last every bit of five years. It's a plasticky build, but it's not built poorly. It's just not built very strongly. It's, um, you might survive a drop or two, but it doesn't feel like 100% premium. It feels a lot like the Fujifilm Instax Mini 90, which is their top-of-the-line flagship regular analog camera. In fact, I think the Mini 90 feels a little bit more beefier all in all. And that has to do with the Mini 90's black rubberized coating instead of this just black plastic made to appear rubberized, which it's actually not. As we look around the camera, we enjoy that. This is screens how we interact with the camera. We find that we have a rotating lens ring as well as a film selection ring right here. We've got film effects and filters and stuff like that. That's where your 10 different effects and 10 different filters show up so that you can have all different kinds of really, really cool imagery. Uh, for me, I find two or three of them that I like and I set them to the, to the instant button right there so I can just switch between, between them. Makes it very simple. To print an image is very easy as well. All we do is pull this lever right here. I have no film in the cartridge right now. It tells me that I'm done, but um, it's very simple. Now, to load, all we do is open up the camera, pull out the box, put another one in. That's that. It will automatically eject film. Since there's no film in there, it'll give me an error message and tell me to turn the thing off. I will allow it to continue. The quick walk around means that we've also got a tripod mount right here, which is really nice. You're going to want that in case you ever want to do any self-timer shots like that, multiple images on the same 
shot, which is real nice. And then right up here, we have a countdown LED. It'll flash a little bit more, of course, and a selfie mirror. Now, this is really nice. The way they've put this all together, we've got a, a button here to take the picture and a button here to take the picture. They really want you to use this camera in portrait orientation because that's how the print comes out. It'll come out just like that. Actually, it'll come out upside down, but it'll be in this orientation when you bring it out. All in all, the ergonomics in the camera feels great. I enjoy using it for those reasons that we've talked about. Now, what might you do with this camera overall? If you're just getting into photography and you're asking yourself, hey, you know, I'd like a camera, I'd like something, what would be a good idea um, as for me? Uh, would it be better to have, um, well, an analog camera or the, the digital camera like this, the Mini Evo or the Mini 90? I'm going to tell you right now, I think the Mini Evo has dethroned my previous favorite Instax camera. It's just a good camera period. In fact, I'll go so far as to say it is a good instant camera. It is a good instant camera. It is a bad digital camera. And if you understand what I'm saying there, then you're going to be just fine if you decide that that's what you want. This is a good instant camera. It's a bad digital camera. It's a bad digital camera because the digital files are no good. I don't like them at all. Uh, that is not just subjective. That's objective. If you saw the files, watch my video, you probably would decide that there's not enough information in the files for you to do anything with. I mean, you're not printing an 8x10 with these either. The images files are so small, the dimensions are so small, you're just not printing an 8x10. So if you wanted to print this really cool portrait of my son and myself, then you couldn't because there's, there's not enough data to print it there at an 8x10. It would look pixelated, stretched, smudged, and ugly. Okay, so that's why it's not a good digital camera. But this image right here is an excellent instant image. I believe that it rivals the quality that you would get from the Instax uh, Mini 90. Now, I do believe that the Mini 90 is a little bit better in image quality, and we can tell that because the Mini 90 will actually give you a little bit of background separation. You can actually get some background blur. But being that the sensor on the Mini Evo is so small, and it's a wide-angle lens, pretty much everything is in focus. So finding that perfect focus and finding that macro focus or whatever um, isn't really a problem. It's Everything's going to be in focus for the most part when you take the picture. So you won't have a lot of shallow depth of field. You definitely won't have a lot here, and that's saying something that you would have more here on the Instax Mini 90 than the Mini Evo. But that background blur, bokeh, doesn't make everything in a camera, right? There's more to it than just bokeh. If you really want bokeh, you're looking at something like the TL70. It's just the way that it is. If you get the TL70, recognize that there is a steep learning curve. You're going to go through some film, but once you get it, you're going to have it. And I've got I've got my first 100 uh, shots on here, and I went all the way out to 350, 35 packs, detailing how to get the best image quality out of this camera. F8 plus ND8 makes it great. Just go there. Okay, so... Which camera do I reach for when I'm heading out? The Mini Evo, period. The fact that the, the screen is hard to use outside in the sunlight, unusable actually, let's, let's not dance around it, isn't that important. You can get a pop on the top viewfinder that gives you a little 28 mil viewfinder. You don't even need that. Basically, if you just look over the top, you're seeing the frame the camera's going to take. So as long as you're looking straight forward, you're not going to really uh, come up with too much parallax unless things are really close, and then it wouldn't focus anyways. Printing the image is fun. People love it, and there's a magic to Fujifilm. Now, another question that I get is, hey, can I change the borders halfway through? Like I start shooting with a white pack, and I want to shoot with a black pack. No. You only get 10 prints. Whatever border you've put in is what you're going to get on the inside. Now, I've got 10, uh, a couple of separate types of film right here. I think these are upside down. I've got... Uh, black and white, okay? I've got um, the monochrome. I've got the black border. And then I've got my favorite, actually, for weddings is Mermaid Tail. I really like this. And there's a way to buy your film. You can go into Walmarts and buy them sometimes on the clearance section, the specialty films like the Mermaid Tail and the Black Frame. They're going to be uh, a little bit less. You have to look around. Generally speaking, you can get the multiple packs, like the red pack or the blue pack of Fujifilm, white bordered film. That's going to be your cheapest the cheapest I can get it right now, this is 2022, it's August 29th, um, I can get 
in my local Walmart on clearance, the mermaid for about eight bucks for 10 shots, which is 80 cents. And if I buy the red pack of 100 images, I can get it for $62, which is 62 cents per shot. If you're paying Fujifilm's retail pricing, you're going to pay uh, $15 for 20 shots, um, which is a little bit more, um, 75, 80 cents about. And then if you're buying the the specialty films at the retail price, it's going to be 11 to $15 per pack of 10. So $1. ten to $1.50 a pop. The point I'm saying there is don't trust Amazon prices. Do the math on how many prints you get divided by how much you're spending and check Best Buy and Walmart often. Those things right there, I think, are the most important things you need to know about this really great camera. I like it quite a bit, and I hope that it's been helpful for you. I've got a complete color settings guide on how to get the best, the best colors from printing and uh, rich mode saturation and everything else. Don't forget to check that out as well. This is a complete go for me. Uh, before we do check out, let's talk about where this could go. Fujifilm has been building this line. They've really got the ultimate point and shoot camera right here, almost, right? What they need to improve on. At, at the $200 price point, this is what they could do. That's it. We need a four to $600 price point instant camera. You and I, if you're watching this video, would buy it if we had two things. Number one, Fuji, let us unlock manual, right? We know it's ISO 800 film, allow us to manually meter the camera. Give us the beautiful additional dials like we get on the, uh, the, the X-T2 and the X-100F. Yes, I know that it's instant film. The reason they want to lock it down so that we can't adjust those things and only use exposure compensation is they're trying to minimize the risk of user dissatisfaction by completely blowing out the film. Trust your user base. Put the standard mode in there as automatic, but give us a manual mode as well. Also, update the build quality. Give us some aluminum or something to protect us out that we're housing. At uh, 380 bucks, we have a completely aluminum protected outdoor housing on this TL70. Plastic uh, polycarbonate frame on the inside, but aluminum all around the gravity areas, as well as soft touch material. Extremely high quality feel to it. The next thing is you must upgrade the sensor, Fujifilm. We need at least a half inch sensor. I uh, prefer a one inch sensor. We know that you've done it. Fujifilm has done that with other cameras they've had uh, eight, nine years ago. They had the half inch. They had the three quarter inch sensor, things like that. They had the one inch sensor. Give us that sensor on this camera and unlock a RAW or a DNG mode. Now, this would be, I'd pay 600 bucks for it all day long. And it would be technology that Fujifilm has already built with sensors they've already used, which are probably still in their inventory or their supply chain. We don't need to cannibalize any of the larger market. It doesn't need to be an APS-C size sensor. We don't need to go into X, um, the 100, the GFX 100 series, just a little better sensor so that someone could truly walk around with this camera as their document it, their life camera. As it sits, the only thing that stops that now is the low dynamic range of the film, which would be, well, guys, if we had a better sensor, we'd have much better dynamic range. We'd be able to use it in low light much better. Give us a Xenon flash or a choice between Xenon. Actually, that's a cool idea. Give us a Xenon and an LED flash on here, two of them. We can choose which one we need to use depending on the situation. And then we'd be able to use this camera in more scenarios. And we'd be able to print with this camera. And we'd be able to document with this camera. And it could be your take everywhere camera. Guys, those are my hopes and dreams and tips. Oh, man, been a lot of fun. I want to thank you so much for watching today. I'm getting ready to send us all out. Let's get that little outro music going. Yeah, it sounds good. And I want to thank you guys again for watching. It's been my video. Catch you on the flip side.